Welcome. Thank you for joining us for First Person Conversations with Holocaust Survivors. My name is Bill Benson. I have hosted the museum's First Person program since it began in 2000. Through these monthly conversations, we bring you first-hand accounts of survival of the Holocaust. Each of our first person guests serves as a volunteer at the museum. We are honored to have Holocaust survivor Albert Gary share his individual personal account of the Holocaust with us today. Albert, thank you so much for agreeing to be our first person today. Thank you. Albert, you have so much to share with us in our short time together today. Please begin by telling us a bit about your early life. Well, I was born in 1938, which was not a very glorious year. It was the year of uh, the Anschluss of Munich and Kristallnacht. So uh, it was not a very, uh, it was a very uh, d threatening year, actually. And uh, my parents were from Turkey. They, they had moved to France in 1923. Uh, it's a long story, but uh, uh, Turkey was part of the Ottoman Empire. And uh, since the Ottoman Empire uh, joined forces with Germany during the First World War, when Germany was defeated in the First World War, the, Gem the Ottoman Empire was dismantled. And then came a strong man by the name of Mustafa Kemal, or Ataturk, which means the father of modern Turkey. And uh, the Jews uh, started, you know, to feel uncomfortable. They didn't know what was in store with this new strong man. And a lot of Jews decided to immigrate. In including both your, your parents, who I believe didn't know each other at that time. No, they didn't know each other. They met in Paris. Mm -hmm. Actually, they, they went to they went to France because they had been educated in a school of Alliance Israelite Universelle, which was an international organization which opened schools all over the Ottoman Empire where uh, where education was provided in French. So my parents were perfectly fluent in French. <coughs> Albert, apart from being fluent in in French. You described to me your father as smart but self-educated. Tell us a bit about your father. Yeah, my father uh, did go to school until the age of 10. That was it. At, at the age of 10, he was taken out of school. And he started wor working to help his parents. That's how, you know, they were poor, and that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And how about your mom? Tell us a little bit about her. My mom was more educated. My mom uh, was in, was schooled until the age of uh, 17 or 18. She got a degree called le Brevet Supérieur. Uh, at that time, it was equivalent of baccalaureate, actually. And um, so she, 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 was, uh, she had a longer education than my father. Yeah. And Albert, by the time you you came along in that terrible year of 1938, your parents had already had two children. And yes. um, tell us about your, your siblings. Yeah, my, uh, my parents uh, immigrated in uh, 1923, and they met in 27 and married in 1928. And my, my uh, elder sister, who passed away, uh, of COVID a couple of months ago, hmm. Jacqueline. I'm so sorry to hear that, Albert. Thank you. Yeah. Um, she she was born in 1930. My my younger sister Gilbert was born in 1933, and I was born in 1938. Albert, tell us a little bit, if you don't mind, about your family's economic circumstances. Well, it was not brilliant, uh, to say the least. My father was a, an accountant. He was working in a garment factory. He was doing the payroll of uh, uh, all the, the employees of the, uh, the factory. And uh, <clears throat> his uh, boss was uh, also a Jew. And he had allow allowed us to uh, live in the janitor's apartment because he knew that uh, 
we were struggling. My parents were struggling with three. Uh, we actually, we were four, four children at that time. But my, uh, I was a twin. Uh, my twin brother died at the age of six months. Yeah. But well, Bear, so, um, the year after you were born, 1939, that's when World War II began, when Germany invaded Poland. But the war really um, didn't come to France until Germany attacked France in May of 1940. You were nearly two years old at that time when German troops advanced on Paris. Nearly 80% of Paris's population fled the city. And you said to me that for your family, it all began with the exodus from Paris. Will you say more about what you meant by that? Yeah, well, that's when we st started to be struck by tragedy, actually. My grandmother, who had uh, gone uh, to do some shopping to get some food for us, she was caught in a bombardment and she was uh, killed by strafing. And, and my mother had a brother and a sister who were uh, uh, my bro my uncle had a car and uh, they were driving south. They were in Orléans already and uh, they were caught in a bombardment and a bomb fell on their car and that each one of them had a son with them and they both, they all, the four of them were killed when a bomb fell on their car. And that was all happening during the Exodus. Albert, we, we, we don't have a photograph of the Exodus, of course, but we do have a piece of art by a survivor which shows the mass of humanity fleeing Paris on foot, bikes, and cars, and wagons. And in my head, that exodus is like a scene from a movie with hundreds of thousands of people r running was, by any means they can. And that, that included you and your family. Where did you end up um, uh, once you left Paris in the midst of those thousands and thousands of others? Well, according to my sisters, because I had no recollection, I was, I was a baby, I was two years old. We took a train to Orléans. Orléans is a city on the River Loire. The River Loire is famous for its beautiful chateau all along, mm -hmm. Chenonceau, uh, Chambord, uh, Blois, and, and, and so on. And uh, we even s slept, I don't know whether it was one night or several nights, in a chateau called Chateau de, de Ville-Savin, there. Uh, it sounds very, exciting but it was not because we were sleeping on the floor and uh, i was crying because my mother had not, had, didn't have anything to feed me and uh, i was crying and disturbing the peace in the uh, of the other people who had stayed in that chateau and uh, at one point <coughs> there was a, a soldier who had escaped you know had fled when the French army was caught uh, by the German army and he was there, he had a flask of schnapps and he gave a shot of schnapps to my mother and he said, try to give him that, maybe that will calm him down. And apparently it did. The schnapps but, worked. Yes. Al Albert, um, your, your father wasn't with you when you fled Paris, was he? No, my father decided to to stay, to keep on working, to make to make his uh, living, you know. If he had uh, left his uh, job, uh, we would have been without any money. Yeah, and so. and is that is that the reason that after you got um, were staying at the chateau, you you ended up returning to Paris? Yes, we returned to Paris because we had nowhere else to go. We had no for, uh, relatives anywhere else. Uh, except maybe in Turkey, but we don't, didn't, we didn't have any relatives, actually. So the only place to go was back to Paris, uh, which now, of course, is occupied by the Germans. Yes. Yeah. And uh, that's what we did. And uh, that's where we started to suffer from the restrictive laws that were uh, promulgated by the, the collaborationist government of uh, Pierre Laval, who decided to collaborate with the uh, German army, and uh, they, they promulgated the statute of the Jews that was depriving the Jews of most of their basic rights. Uh, we were not allowed in public transit. We were not allowed, you know, we were uh, allowed only one hour to do the grocery shopping. 
between, I think it was four and five in the afternoon, and that was it. <coughs> so it, we were uh, we were not allowed to go to the movies or to go yeah, to socialize anything. We had no radio. Because you weren't allowed to have radios, right? We were not allowed. I think my parents had a radio before, but it was confiscated. Right, right. I don't know. But anyway, we didn't have any radio. And so we were really uh, deprived of most of our basic rights. You came back to Paris. Um, the, the Germans and the collaborationist French began imposing all kinds of restrictions. Um, and, but you would stay there for two years until June 1942. Tell us what, what forced your family to finally flee with those restrictions that you were having to live under, um, like you had shop only one hour a day. What, what finally forced you to have to leave your home uh, in June of 1942? What happened is that, uh, you know, we were living in the janitor's apartment of the factory. We were like the concierge of the factory and uh, the, the, the factory belonged to a Jew, uh, Monsieur Talemer, Talheimer, which means uh, inhabitant of the valley. Hmm. And uh, Monsieur Talemer was dispossessed of his uh, factory and he had to flee. And we were uh, evicted from our apartment and we had to find an apartment in no time, uh, in, in July 1942. July for 1942 was one of the worst months during the French occupation. That's when uh, the biggest roundup of all took place, La Rafle du Vélodive, <clears throat> and they, where they rounded up, the Germans had, uh, had asked for uh, 20,000 men to go to work to Germany, but the, the French government could not, you know, they managed to send only 13,000, but not men, men, women, children, elderly people, everybody. And all these people ended up in, in concentration camps, actually. And, and here, Albert, I think we see, we have a scene from, from one of the roundups um, uh, where Jews are being rounded up and herded into trucks. Yes, and you can see it's the French police that is performing this dirty job. Actually, as, as you said to me on another occasion, um, Albert, it was Ju it was the July or June of uh, 1942 when the Germans the, and the French collaborationist government really turned the screws with these massive roundups. So you had to find another place, as you said. What what kind of place were you able to find? We found a, a tiny apartment, two rooms, not two bedrooms, two rooms and uh, a, a tiny kitchen and a toilet. That was it. Two rooms, five of you. Yes, uh, cold water. You know, that was all the comfort we had. So at that point, your, your parents decided um, they needed to find another place for you. What, what did your parents do then? Well, you know, it was not so much because uh, the apartment was too small, but it was because it was dangerous because they, they were running up people like crazy, mm -hmm. old families, you know, grandparents, parents, children. Uh, so my parents wanted to, to spare us the, the danger of being rounded up. And they decided to send, uh, to send us to a farm in Tuari. Tuari is a, a suburb of Paris, actually. It's, it's a remote suburb, actually. It was mostly, uh, at that time, it was mostly uh, farmland. But today, there is a, a safari park there. Mm -hmm. But in those days, it was just farmland. So my sisters would go to school, and I would stay with the ladies. It was two ladies who were uh, tending the farm. So, so there were no men in, in, at, at this no, house? Probably, probably the, the husband had been taken prisoner with the French army. I, right, I, right. I never saw a, a man there, there, and I was too young to ask questions like yeah. that. So that's it's just uh, what I assume now. And and of course, eventually you had to leave that place as well. Tell us, tell us why you had to leave that farm. Yeah, because you know, 
my sisters were, would go to school and I would stay with the two ladies and I would talk. And uh, I was very social, so I was talking to them. And one day in the conversation, I told them that we were Jewish. My parents had not told them that we were Jewish. They just said that we would be better fed in a farm than in Paris, where food was very scarce. Mm -hmm. So when they heard that we were Jewish, they sent us right back to our parents. They didn't want to take any chances being, being exposed, uh, hiding Jewish children. Which, I, which would have been dangerous for them, I guess, yes, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So you return, you return to your parents, um, uh, your, 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 your sisters, and you go, you go back. In, in September of 1943, your father was taken for forced labor to the Channel Islands between England and France. Soon after that, your mother, your sisters, and you went into hiding. Tell us what you can about your father being forced to leave to go to forced labor and then your mother finding a place for the rest of the family to hide well it was not easy uh, my father uh, was taken away in september 1943 and my mother was terrified this is the card that uh, was uh, made of my gary benjamin that's my father and if you read you have deportation, it means he was deported in a camp on the Channel Island of Oldenay, Origny, which is uh, uh, in the Channel between France and Britain, actually. And they were, and they were building uh, what they call the Atlantic Wall, trying to stop uh, the, the invasion from the Allies. So they were building bunkers, uh, blockhouses, and uh, and uh, and this was all done by forced laborers like your father being forced to do this work. Yes, under very rough conditions. Yeah. Um, this that card you just showed us, Albert, uh, that was specifically about your father being deported to that island. That's something you actually uh, came across at the museum, right? Exactly. I. I there's a gentleman on the second floor in the museum. I went to see him, he had a computer. I said, can you find something about my father? And he checked and he found that, uh, that card. Wow. So. Al Albert, um, I know you remember, you've told me that you actually remember your father leaving you. Um, oh, absolutely. absolutely. No, actually, you know, when, when, uh, he left, uh, he had to take the metro. The metro was about a mile, a little more than a mile away from our home. Usually we would take a bus to go to the metro station. But that time we walked, we wanted to spend a little more time with our fa uh, with my, my father. And um, so we walked all the way to the metro station. I remember my father carrying his gas mask. He had a a box, a cylindrical box, in which he had his gas mask. They were provided gas mask because they they were, they were afraid that there might be a danger of uh, gas warfare, like uh, there was during the First World War. Right, Albert. Before we talk about what your mother then did with 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 her children, with you and your siblings. Your father suffered a terrible injury while he was doing that forced labor at Alderney. Yeah, my father had a terrible accident. He was walking on the scaffolding, carrying a trough of cement on his head, and uh, he stepped on a loose board, and the board came to hit him on the head, and he fell off a cliff. And he, he was losing his blood, and he was picked up some time later by the soup truck. Yeah, and, and, and he was able to survive that. How... And your, your mother, I, I guess your mother was able to be in touch with your father to learn about this. Yeah, that's the, the only thing that I don't understand is that apparently they were able to, to exchange letters. And I remember, I remember vividly the, the, the letter, not the letters, but the envelopes. Because I couldn't read, uh, it was five years, four or five years. Right. But I remember the envelope with the, Eagle and the swastika on the postmark. 
the Nazi postmark. Yes. <clears throat> so with your father gone, your mom has to spring into action. She's got three children and herself to find a place to go. Tell us what she did. Yeah, she was terrified at the idea that we might be taken away. Because, uh, you know, they would come at night, in the middle of the night, they would bang on the door, house, and they, they would take people out and send them to a camp. And mm -hmm. from that tr transit camp, north of Paris, in the... Uh, um, anyway, uh, I forgot the name now. But uh, they, they, they were sent after that to Auschwitz. So, from this transit camp, like Dronzi, they would be sent to Auschwitz? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's, Funny, I don't remember the name of the camp, and I visited that camp four or five years ago. Yeah. Albert, so your mom, uh, she's terrified. She knows that there's risk every moment. What? Did, how did she find shelter? Yeah, uh, the name of the camp was Drancy. Drancy, yep. I forgot the name. I had forgotten the name. Uh, I'm sorry, what did you ask? How your mom was then able to find a place to take you for safety at that time. It was... Uh, almost miraculous. Uh, she met this lady, Madame Garo, in a street market. She had never seen her before. She had never met her before. And somehow she felt she could open up to her. And she told her that she was terrified that at any moment they could come and take us away. And this lady, Madame Garo, went home to her husband and told her husband the story. And the next day, her husband came to us with a cart and we took whatever personal effects we could and we went to live with the Gallo family. The Gallo family, it was, uh, they had two, two daughters. I was five and they had two daughters, four and three. And you know, hiding a Jewish family uh, was very dangerous for them because if they had been caught hiding a, fam a Jewish family, they would have been uh, deported like, just like us. Mm -hmm. Everybody would have gone. So these people were heroic to me. And But you know, they were Protestant. The Catholic, there were some Catholic uh, people who had helped also, but uh, it was mostly a Protestant family because they had a history of persecutions with the Catholics precisely in France. They had, we had the wars of religions in the 17th century. And so that stayed with them. And, uh, and they were very uh, sense, uh, sympathetic to our yeah. plea, actually. And uh, they came to, uh, Monsieur Garouk came with a cart and we took wh whatever we could and we went to live with them. And we stayed with them for about six months, I would say. This is a picture taken of my mother my sisters and me, in uh, January 1944, when my father was in captivity. And uh, my mother had this picture taken, and she sent it to, uh, to my father. Um, because, because, because they were able to write to each other, as you said. Yes, yeah. They were, yeah, for whatever, you know, that's one of the mysteries, because people, once they were sent to a, a camp in, in, in Poland, that was it. That there was no way to communicate. But when he was in that camp in uh, in the Channel Island, he was still able to communicate with us and to to write to us. And uh, I, re I remember vividly the, the the envelopes, not the letters, but the envelope with the postmark. Yeah. And Albert, you've you've described that time, that six months with the gallows, is for you a pretty happy time. Uh, Mr. Gallo himself was a sculptor. Tell us. Tell us what he did as a sculptor. He was working for the movie studios and he was making sets, movie sets. And they had a big warehouse behind the house where they were storing all these uh, sets. And we had great hide and seek uh, games uh, with uh, Janine and Mireille, the two little girls in, the, in that uh, warehouse. Mm. Albert, I, I know that, um, as just sort of an aside, I know that you are a really uh, serious movie fan, movie buff. Do you think that has any connection back to that time? I don't think so. Uh, no, it was just that, you know, 
in those days there was no television, there was nothing. So the only distraction we had, uh, entertainment, was to go to the movie uh, matinees, Sunday matinees, to the movies. And we would go almost religiously, the whole family, my father, my mother, my sisters and me. And, you know, they were not very discriminating about the movies. It was the movie of the day, of the week. Whatever it was. Whatever it was. He, um, that's where, where I discovered gotcha. Chaplin. That's where I discovered uh, Errol Flynn in Robin Hood. These are, the, you know, to me, these were a, a cultural shock right. to see that. I can imagine. And, and Albert, um, of course, while you're playing hide and seek, for your mom and perhaps for your sisters as well, it was a time of fear. Um, can you say anything about that? Yes, my mother was constantly afraid that my that somebody might uh, report us. Actually, there was a lady in the street. I will come to that in a minute. But uh, yes, we were in constant danger of being reported, and uh, and. For, it was dangerous for us, but it was also dangerous for the Gallo family. Because if we had been reported, they would have taken us away, but they would have taken the Gallo family, their children, their two daughters with them. So these people were, I, you know, I don't, I, I very often wondered whether I would have had the, the courage that they showed to, you know, to take a big gamble of hiding a Jewish family during that period. And, and of course, after six months, you had to leave the gallows. Tell us, tell us why you had to leave their home, because that had been quite a sanctuary for you. Well, actually, the, the gallows were living in, um, in a small house, in a small street. There were about 10 houses altogether. It was mostly artists, painters, sculptors, and uh, there was a painter whose uh, wife was a great admirer of uh, the Reich and the, the uh, of the Nazis, yeah. Nazis, and uh, uh, notorious anti-Semite. And one day, she went to see Madame Gallo because they knew that we were living with the Gallo families, family. And uh, she went to see her and said, "When are you going to get rid of that scum?" So we were the scum. At that point, <clears throat> my uh, mother and Madame Gallo thought it might be safer for us to go home because who knows, she might be tempted to, to report us. So we went back home. Which, of course, was a, f a place where your mom had been so afraid that there would be a, a knock on the door. So what happened? Well, sure enough, a few weeks later, it was a, around around June 1944, around D-Day, actually, one day, one morning, seven o'clock in the morning, we were still, my sisters and me, we were still in bed, my mother was up, there was a knock on the door, two French police inspectors, Madame Gary, yes, we came to take you away. That's what, that was what my mother had been dreading all along. Right. She started shaking and they said, calm down, we're going to report we didn't find you. But you must not sleep in your bed tonight. You have to find another place. So anyway. So she had to find another place. How did she do that? Well, she was given the name of a social worker, Mademoiselle Desjobert, I still remember the name. And uh, <clears throat> And she dressed me very quickly. I was still in bed, you know, when that happened. And uh, she dressed me very quickly. My, and my sisters, we all went to see the social worker, Mademoiselle Desjardins, and uh, to explain the situation. And uh, this social worker said, you know what, you have to allow me a few days because I cannot find a hiding place for each one of you <clears throat> like this overnight. So see, in the meantime, if you can sleep at your neighbor's, not in your apartment, because if they come back to your apartment and they bang on the door and they find you there, they're going to take you away. So 
my mother, we went back to our neighbors and the, the neighbors were wonderful, actually. They all offered to, to uh, take us and we stayed, my mother and I stayed with our next door neighbors, a, co a communist couple. She was working in a print shop and he was working, uh, he was making a uh, wrought iron uh, banisters. He made one in, in the palace of Monaco, actually. That was one of his- ba Banisters for stairs, <laughs> right? Yeah. Banis banisters, yes. And he made the one for the staircase at the Monaco palace, wow. Prince Rainier. And uh, <clears throat> so they were working on night shifts. I, I, his wife, I understand, because she was working in a print shop, so maybe they were printing newspapers, I don't know, but she they were working on night shifts. So we would sleep in their bed at night, and in the morning when, when they would come back, we would give them the bed and, and stay in the apartment. And we stayed like that for a few days, until eventually the social worker came back to my mother and said, I found a place for each one of you. And my mother was placed as a governess with a family of eight or ten children near the Eiffel Tower. And we were placed in uh, Catholic boarding schools in the suburb in the east of Paris, Montfermeil, which is famous, made famous by an episode of Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. That's where uh, Jean Valjean meets Cosette, actually, in Montfermeil. Which is where the boarding school was that you were in? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Before you tell us about the boarding school, your your so your mother, the the social worker somehow found basically a, a job for her as a governess. Obviously, that family, I'm assuming, had no idea who your mother really was. I suppose so. I don't. I have no idea about that. Yeah. But she was caring. She was caring for eight she, or ten kids. Yes, it was a big family. That's wow. I know. And, uh, but she had no way to communicate with us and to know exactly. Well, she knew where we were. That's all. She knew but, we were in these boarding schools in Montfermeil, but she had no way. Said, first of all, there was no transport. There was no trains or anything like that. And it would have been very dangerous for her to take a train to come to see us. So we were completely cut out of our mother, our father, was still still away and um, so and uh, and I was completely isolated because my sisters were in a school for girls and I was in a school for boys. I would meet them every Sunday in church. Because you would meet your sisters in church every Sunday. Yes, because it was a it was Catholic boarding school, so they would take us to to mass every Sunday morning. And that's when I would see my sisters. I was six years old. Can you imagine a six-year-old boy cut out of his family? But I had already some experience because we had been in that uh, in in Tuari and in that farm before. So I had to make do with that. Yeah. And Albert, you shared with us the how kind to you the, the headmistress was towards you and took you under her wing. But um, conditions were really tough for you there, for everybody, I guess. What what was the food circumstances like for you? The, the, the toughest uh, thing in that school was the, the, the food. The food was terrible. Well, of course, it was the war. Right. I, I don't blame it particularly on that school, but we, we were fed... It, it, it was terrible. I remember the rotten beans. I remember that I was constantly sick. I was uh, suffering my, uh, from my stomach. My, and, uh, and I lost a lot of weight. Yeah, I was very skinny. So You, you shared with me, Albert, that um, um, you, you were actually treated, in a sense, with mashed potatoes, yes. Yeah, yeah actually... The, the priest was suffering from some sort of cancer or ulcer, I don't know. And they managed to get some potatoes to, 
to give him uh, mashed potatoes with a, a small piece of butter. And even that he could not, he could not swallow. So I was fed the mashed potatoes that had been made for the, for the priest. And that was the best meal, the only good meal that I had during that period. And since then, I, I love mashed potatoes. To this day. To this day. To this day. So this is the summer of 1944. It's now August 1944. You're six years old, uh, separated from your, your mom and, of course, your dad and your sisters are in the other boarding school. While you were there, you were liberated. Um, tell, us, tell us about the liberation uh, that you experienced. A memorable experience, actually. Uh, yeah, one of the boys from the school had left the school and he came back saying, the Allies are coming. So we all went on the main street and we saw, uh, like on this picture, you know, soldiers with a different helmet. It was not the German helmet anymore. <clears throat> and uh, smiling, giving us a chocolate, uh, cigarettes, chewing gum. Cigarettes, you say too, right? No, not to me, but uh, okay. <laughs> I was a bit too young for that. And anyway, the hidden mistress was not letting go of my hand. I was, she was always holding my hand during that time. I, and it was the first time in my life that I heard about Americans. You mean heard about them at all? You had never heard of Americans? No, never. Until that day, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You no, knew who the British were? were, yeah. We knew everything about the Germans, of course, the Italians, the British. The, 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 Amer the Gen Americans, where do they come from? I have no idea. Needless to say that I fell in love. <laughs> but, Albert, uh, then soon after that, of course, you were able to reunite with your sisters and your, and your mother. Tell us what you remember about that. Well, actually, one day, when they, they, you know, once the, we were liberated, they restored the train service. And uh, my mother was on the first train to come to visit us. She was so worried about us. And she came to see us. And one day, I, I was, uh, you know, hanging around in the playground with the other kids. And I see my sisters coming and say, guess who's here? Guess who's here? I had no idea. You know, a six-year-old, it's amazing how fast we can forget about our loved ones. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea who could be there. So I pushed my sisters and uh, around and they, I saw my mother behind them. And when I saw my mother, I jumped into her arms. And uh, I must say she was appalled to see how skinny I was. Yeah. And, you know, she had the ration tickets to buy uh, food. She bought a loaf of bread and uh, we swallowed the loaf of bread in no time. That's how hungry we were. We were constantly hungry. And the, the bread was not good. It was dark bread. I, we were dreaming of white bread, but the, the white bread came after the war. And in those days, it was dark bread and it was with a, uh, brand and I don't know what else. Yeah. They say they, they, they even sometimes put so sawdust in the in the bread. So and, and Albert, aside from you know eating that loaf of bread very quickly initially, uh, you had to have some sort of special treatments though because of your poor nutrition and how much weight you had lost. So, yeah, that that was when when we got home actually. Uh, when my mother took me home the same day. And mm -hmm. for whatever reason, I don't know, she had to go back and it was far. It was very far. She had to take a, a metro and a train to come and, and then walk a few miles because the train wouldn't go all the way to Montfermeil. It would stop, I don't know where exactly, but so she, she went back the next day to pick up my sisters and she came back in the evening, and in the meantime, she left me under the custody of our neighbor, Madame Menetrier, 
with the same the same family that you'd uh, spent a few nights with um yes yep <clears throat> and uh, and there was a green apple in the house that was the only thing that i could eat there that, that there was to be eaten so i i grabbed it and i i swallowed it in no time and uh, as soon as i finished i heard the key it was madame minetrier who was checking on me and when she saw that I had been eating something and she found out that it was a green apple, she was not happy about that. And anyway, but that was, that's all we had in the house. And my mother came back the same day, the evening <coughs> with my sisters and we were home. Meanwhile, my father, who had been on the island of Alderney, in May, one month before D-Day, the, the Germans, the, the Allies were bombarding the Straits of Dover and to make uh, the Germans believe that if there was an invasion, it would, take, it would take place in the Straits of Dover, which is the shortest distance between France and Britain. Make them think it was there rather than Normandy? Exactly. Yeah. They, they, they thought... Uh, Landing would take place in the Straits of Dover. So they were bombarding there. And the, so the Germans transferred all the inmates with my father uh, to the Straits of Dover. And my father was wor working under the bombardments of the, the Allies. And my father told me one story about that. He said, one, one day there was a bombardment like that. And when that, that happened, they had to lay flat on the on the ground, and my father was on the ground next to a German soldier. And uh, when the raid was over, my father could stand up, and the German soldier had been killed. So. Albert, you you shared with me on another time that uh, as they were bombed by the Allies um, at, at these uh, at where they were doing the construction work. Uh, there was no shelter typically for for the uh, forced laborers, so they had to just lie flat on the ground exactly. in the hopes that they would not get hit by those bombs. That's what happened. Yeah, you know, when she, he was laying flat on on the ground when the German soldier next to him was killed. Killed. He could he could have been killed too. Actually. Absolutely, and 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 obviously could have been killed earlier in that terrible accident you shared with us. So, at some point um, after your father and the rest of the, uh, I think some eight hundred or nine hundred forced laborers, they were they were then moved. Uh, they were taken by train to head further inland. Tell us about that. Yes, when uh, the the Allies were pushing the Germans back towards Germany. East. Uh, at one point, the, 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 the Germans uh, transferred, decided to transfer all the inmates. There were 900, some 900 inmates, and they put them on a train bound for Germany. We don't know what they had in store for them. Maybe they wanted to send them to a death camp, or maybe they went, wanted to use them in a factory as slave labor, we don't know. But anyway, the train was stopped in Belgium by Belgian resistance fighters. And there was a, a, a battle between the resistance and the German soldiers. And uh, in the confusion, the Germans released the 900 inmates. And my father walked all the way from Belgium to Paris. It was about a 150 uh, mile uh, trek. It took him a few days, maybe a couple of weeks, I don't know. And um, he came back home. And he came back home the morning of Rosh Hashanah, which is a Jewish New Year. And this was September 1944, right? Yep. September 22nd or 23rd, 1944. And my mother was dressing me to go to synagogue for the first time, because uh, we hadn't been to a synagogue, of course, for four years. And uh, and there was a knock on the door, 
And this time, it was my father who was coming back. We knew that he was coming back because he, wa he had been uh, detained. He was uh, deported with a, a cousin, one of his cousins. And the cousin came back early and told my mother that he was on his way. So we knew that we could expect him back, but we didn't know exactly when. And he came back the morning of Rosh Hashanah. And do you remember? Do you remember what that was like to have your father come back? Of course. Yeah. I remember when he, he left when he with his gas mask and all. That, he went to to the metro. He took the metro, and I remember when he came back. Your father, of course, he was almost killed in a terrible accident. Um, almost, you know, in, had to flee and worry about bombs. He's on a train that gets attacked by the resistance, and then he walks 150 or more miles to get to you. What, what kind of condition was your father in? My father was a sort of superman, very strong. I would not have uh, survived a tenth of what he went through, actually. He was very strong, so he, he survived. And uh, he walked. I think he walked. There was no transport or anything, maybe sometimes. Uh, a, a truck would help, would take him. I, I have no, no knowledge of that, but I think most of, most of the time he was walking yeah. from Belgium, 150 miles away, to Paris. Albert, we have uh, two pictures I'd like um, to, for you to tell us about them. The first is of you, and then we have one of your father. Maybe we can bring those up. That's me in school uh, in 1945 or 46. So that's at, at, after your liberation, maybe after the war? After the war. Yeah, after the war. And then we have a photograph of your father. Yes. And if you can see here the scars, that's from his injuries when he fell off a cliff. It, it looks like a major indentation in his head. Yes, exactly. it, it, actually, it looked like a question mark. Yeah. yeah. Albert, I have one um, last question for you, if that's okay. Um, and that is, tell us why you continue to share your firsthand account of what you and your family went through during the Holocaust. I'm not the only one, actually. We are, we are 50 at the museum, and we are 50 because we lost a lot of them to old age. And... Uh, but we think that uh, we had a unique experience that is worth uh, telling so that the, 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 the kids, the new generations, and even the, the military, actually, sometimes we speak to military people. <clears throat> they have to, to be aware, to, to, to hear about our stories. Mm -hmm. It's very important. So, you know, if you... If you don't want to repeat that kind of tragic history, you have to, to be aware of it. Right. Well, we are so grateful that you do. Um, so thank you so much, Albert, for sharing uh, what you went through with us. I know that you couldn't even begin to touch the surface of everything that happened. You just gave that example a moment ago of another close call. There's no question that there were other close calls that you don't even know about. And um, I, I think I'm sure that our fellow audience members here um, not only are grateful for you sharing this extraordinary account of what you went through with your family, um, but are so, so aware of the description of separation after separation from your father, from your mother, from your sisters, and how you found refuge with strangers and neighbors. And what really comes across uh, in such a profound way is your mother's resilience, bravery, and resourcefulness. Um, and so thank you for continuing to be willing to share your story with us. Um, I look forward to another opportunity for you to do this. Thank you, Albert, so very much. Thank you. First Person is made possible through generous support from the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation with additional funding from the Arlene and Daniel Fisher Foundation.